people who have an adoption mindset, they focus on adoption, are the people who um, make the biggest gain on hitting the business case. So I would say standardize the solution, focus on adoption. If you do those two things, they're the kind of biggest two ingredients to winning on budget and winning on um, kind of outcome. Thanks so much for joining another edition of The Never Ending Climb for companies running SAP for a stronger supply chain and procurement. And our number one add on for procurement helping bring this here today, we have Stuart Brown. And I am so excited that Stuart can join to share his experience, knowledge. Stuart is the founder and CEO of a business side SAP consultancy. And they help make sure that companies are in the 30% that get what they're looking for out of programs and investments, not the 70% that don't. So, Stuart, thank you so much for joining uh, all the way from the UK today. No problem. I really appreciate you asking, actually. So, Stuart, when we first met, you'd published a beautiful piece of research that dove into companies that win and companies that don't for these large investments, what are the yep. key drivers of success? And for years, I have forwarded that to friends and colleagues and uh, other people that I've met that are about to embark on one of these because it is such an important piece of research to go and understand what did companies fail at, what got in their way, and what made the difference from them actually getting the value out of these investments in these big SAP programs. Can you share a couple of highlights of that? Why did we do it, I guess, first? So we did it because I spent the first half of my career running SAP Centers of Excellence, catching programs that had gone live too early um, and seeing the fallout. And we've been invited into lots of programs to rescue them midway through and never really get the chance to do that Um what would I have told my 15 year old self think in from a program perspective? So we did this from a perspective of, well, let's try and work that out. Um, and there's a slight nuance as well. You said, you know, what of the ones who failed done wrong? It's very deliberately called the SAP success report. So it focuses on what the ones who did it well did right, not what the ones who did it wrong did wrong. If yeah. I if I pull my car out of a junction and smash into somebody, finding out why doesn't make me a Formula One driver. <laughs> you, you've, you've got to know what what's good, what works for the people who are successful, not what didn't work for the ones who fail. So yeah. we came up with the notion of um, success levers. We kind of crowdsource within our team. What are the levers that drive success? I had a hypothesis of about 15 of them. Then we tested that across, across about 120, I think, SAP programs. Yeah. Um, and I've got the beautiful document. I've got it here in front of me. Um, oh, yes. So, so rather than trying... So I don't make them up and get it wrong. I'm going to put it in front of me and go. I'll go through some of them, you know, properly. Um, there's things in there like connected strategy. So have you connected the program to the business strategy? Strong project management's obviously one. High solution awareness. How aware is the business of the solution it's implementing before they start, versus being you know, learning on the hoof? Um, yeah, learning as it's getting rolled out. Yeah. The big one that came out of this was the focus on adoption, high adoption focus. That's probably the one that makes the most difference. And it kind of surprised us when we did the research and correlated all the feedback, but it's really obvious in hindsight, right? So you're implementing some systems that change your processes. If people don't adopt the processes, then you don't hit your business case. It's so obvious when you say it like that, but actually uh, when we thought about it, we'd never worked on a program where the word adoption had been part of the day-to-day -day parlance you hear training but not adoption training is a process adoption is an outcome so, yeah. so adoption was the big one and that really resonated with us that's the thing where we thought we really need to focus here on making sure clients think of adoption first rather than thinking about the technical solution and thinking of the scope and so on so that's probably the biggie i would say uh, but there was 15 of these levers and we correlated them with programs that have been on time on budget and they had hit their, actually hit their business case in terms of outcomes. I love it. I love it. The idea of focusing on what helped people win. It's a little bit of a corollary for me of how team development and development of new staff and existing staff and emerging leaders 
so often there's the, well, this is really holding you back. You've got to work on this as opposed to these are the things you're amazing at. Let's help you get even better at that. And then just polish off some of the rough edges that might be slowing you down, but helping somebody focus in on, to your point, learning how to be the F1 driver of what they're good at is yeah. so, so important. It's so different, but I think you said something really important is you often get the call when things are starting to go off the rails. And if you could go back and have a conversation with some of those leaders that I'm sure they were given all kinds of assurances that don't worry, we've done this before. We're good at this. Don't worry. It's not a problem. We've got you this. We've got you dot, dot, dot. And all of that, that then turned into something that's going a little sideways. If you could go back to one of those leaders at an organization when they're embarking on the program, what would you hope they remember? What would you hope they take with them into that program? That If they got to that train wreck, there's something yeah. coming off the rails. It's probably a little late, but if you could back up, what would you want them to remember? So it's interesting this, before I jump into the answer to that. So we closed the investment round We've been in business 20 years this year, and last year we took an investment, went through some quite deep due diligence to secure that investment for growth. And one of the questions we were asked quite a few times, we focus on business side consultancy, we're not an SI. Uh, so we don't really compete with SIs. So we were asked by the investors, so who are your, what's your competition? Who's your biggest competitor? And I found myself saying the two biggest competitors we have is ignorance and arrogance. So it's people who are starting a program that either don't know or think they know. Yeah, And that's a good hook for the, to answer this question. We get people who um, are honestly lost and need the, the help of, you know, what do I do? How do I start? We win lots of business from those kind of uh, com people coming from a pitch situation of naivety or lack of understanding and recognizing that. And they're usually easy to fix. But the people who are arrogant and go into this and assume they know everything, especially execs who say, yeah, okay, I'm setting up a team, give some of my junior people to the program, um, I'll stay out of the way and let this happen and lose that connected strategy and lose that oversight. That's yeah. the biggest failing. Execs who just think this is an IT project, you know, I'll send, I'll send me the pack every somebody, month. I'll, I'll delegate it, which usually is not delegation, but abdication. It, totally, yeah, yeah. yeah. And that walking the floors and being part of the steerco and just connecting the strategy in the back with the program. Yeah. Um, I think change management happens before a program starts. It doesn't happen as a phase in a program. So you've really got to tell the narrative of what you're going to do, even before you issue an RFP to your SI to respond to. Because if you can't articulate business value and the strategic narrative to them, they won't build that into their thinking. We now do a lot of road mapping, independent ERP road mapping, help people do an S4 business case. And we start with that. We start with um, another beautiful book. We start with, we build these playbooks that are kind of a narrative arc no word of technology in there. It's the execs and the business leaders articulating what the future will look like post-transformation in business and strategic terms. And then yeah. give that to the SI to say, yes, answer my RFP, but this is the context. This is the top of the jigsaw box. And that right. embedding strategic change, linking it with things that matter to the business before you get into the program, I think is really, really important. It makes a world of difference. It's like that very Canadian expression, skate to where the puck is going, not to where it is yeah, now. Yeah, Wayne Gretzky, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. What I think a lot of that arrogance and ignorance comes from, uh, I tend to associate that with organizations that feel like they'll just hire some people, as you said, hand it over to them, you know, hire good people, get out of their way, I think is sometimes confused with delegation or leadership when it's actually more of a form of abdication. And the decision-making through the strength of sponsorship, strength of leadership, and the ability of the sponsor of whatever that program is to help get decisions made. Because sometimes those are the things that draw out the longest is there's 18 people on the call and everyone's like, I don't know, they got to make the call. I don't know who can make the decision. And that's paralyzing and super, super expensive. I find that there's organizations that uh, there's multiple ways that they do this, but they're kind of penny wise, pound foolish, or they're stepping over dollars to pick up dimes and feeling like they're winning when they're, again, to your point, focusing on kind of the wrong driver, or they're focusing on the wrong cost. And a lot of the audience are procurement and supply chain professionals. And through 
RFPEs and RFIs, sometimes it happens where somebody is so cost focused that they'll say, no, we're going to hire a team of independent contractors for $100 an hour instead of the SI at obviously a higher price. But there's different capabilities and there's a different um, anchor for outcome, especially if somebody's working to more of a fixed price outcome. What can you share with folks around, especially for procurement supply chain leaders, what are the most common ways that some of those uh, overemphasis on cost uh, or those stepping over dollars to pick up dimes kind of habits get in the way of unlocking the value, unlocking the success? Rate cards are the obvious one, aren't they? I mean, rate, lots of procurement focuses on what, for, for consultancies, what's your day rate, what's your rate card? Um, kind of shave $5 a day off your rate card. Can you discount your rate card? And it's kind of like, well, if you get a utility bill, whether it's electricity or gas or water, there's probably some unit per something you don't understand. There's a unit per megawatt or something like that. We don't walk around our houses thinking I've used four megawatts today. We just get our electricity bill at the end of the month and think, oh, shit, that's expensive. Oh, yeah, yeah we, we don't. And I think it's the same with day rates, which is you negotiate a day rate with no notion of how much effort's involved and whether you understand the accuracy or precision of the estimates that you get in, and you can't challenge those estimates. So you can't, your rate card is kind of like saying, I'll agree to $17 per megawatt hour. I don't know what that means in terms of my household heating, but if I can get half a dollar off that, I'm happy. But then you've got no way of controlling the consumption of that because you can't challenge it. You can't challenge the estimates. You've got no confidence in the estimates. The quality of the people, you know, you can pay $500 an hour for an imbecile or an expert, you've got no way of knowing which is which because you don't understand the thing you're about to buy. You can buy a pen for a dollar or for 10 cents, um, but you may find a very different quality between the two and it will not be apparent until after you've received the order, right? Yeah, that's exactly right. And there's so many other factors as well. Things like churn of staff on programs and attrition of knowledge. You know, you bring in a load of contractors, you nickel and dime on the rate, they get a higher offer somewhere else, they leave mid-program, they walk out the door, you lose a month, knowledge walks out the door with them, you've got to cross-train people, testing stops, you know, things like that. They sound like minor bumps in the road, but actually when you compound those together, it's a huge impact on, on programs. They really are, um, yeah. Yeah, and your 70% thing you mentioned before, which is, I think our stat from our report is about 70% of programs are over, over budget and over plan, and 50% are don't hit their business case, which by the way is a frightening number. If, if you were on a plane and the pilot said there's a 50% chance we're going to land safely, you wouldn't buckle up, you'd get off, right? Yeah. But if 70% are overrunning, the contingency you need, the run rate of a program, a big program's you know, churning a couple of million dollars a month, a week of delay, is, it's not, it's, you're not going to save that in the pennies and pounds or cents on a day rate, you're going to save that by proper governance and management of the throughput of the program. Yeah. I think that's a really important idea for folks to take home of the cost focus versus the value focus. And the rates are usually just one small part of the equation. One of the other ones that we often run into is when something is identified as this is important, but vanilla doesn't do that. The default response is usually, well, I guess we'll have to custom build that. But this is something that uh, that's that's from 20 years ago, because there's now a whole ecosystem of pre-built, pre-packaged solutions that might address that last, you know, when you get 80% of what out of the box, that last 10, 20, 15%, it's entirely likely there's things that are out there that can help take care of that without spending nine months and a million dollars on something custom. Yeah, we've got a really cool approach to this in our roadmap and engagement. So without going into vast detail on it, and there's videos on our website uh, that go through this, but um, the first thing we'll do is an inventory of business process. And that's not... Let's map the processes. Let's just list them. You know, level three processes. 70% of organizations don't have that. So yep. step one, have an inventory of processes. Then what we do is we heat map them for which ones drive competitive advantage. And we do that on a scale. So the middle of that scale is they're just commodity processes. If you post journals, doesn't move the needle on your company performance, you've got to do that anyway. It's not going to make you a better company. But some things drive top line competitive advantage. Some things drive bottom line. So you're either going to make more or save more. So we do a heat map of those processes and say, okay, which of these processes? Posting journal is a commodity process. It might be that issuing an RFX, RFP, is a 
but it's got a huge bottom line competitive advantage because it will save money for the business or it might have an impact on your ESG and sustainability. So we score the processes and then we say, OK, let's look at where you've customised your systems today against those processes. And we, we plot that on the other axis. You can instantly demonstrate all the previous kind of enhancement dollars and customization dollars have gone on commodity processes that don't drive competitive edge. And when you demonstrate that and say, okay, going forward, if we're going to cust- we'll standardize commodity, because it doesn't matter, and we'll invest in the things that drive competitive edge and use that to sense and ensure design governance and design authority, suddenly you have a model, which is when people think RISEF to the design surgery or enhancements to the design surgery, you can say, well, where does it sit? If it sits on that middle line, forget it, not doing it. And yeah. it's such a simple, that's a much simpler way of saving money than knocking five cents off a day rate. Yeah. You, you're carving out hundreds of thousands of pounds of, of wasted development with, with that model. So much gold right there. Stuart, when somebody is getting ready for one of these programs, the ignorance and arrogance is something that is sometimes driven by budgets, where the inability for an organization to spend a little money now to save a lot later uh, is sometimes a hurdle for organizations to get over because they maybe feel like their hands are tied this year um, because their budget doesn't open up until next year and they're, they're supposed to get it all done within the 12 months. What do you see organizations as leaders at organizations that want to make sure they're not ignorant and they're not arrogant and that they can get some of the help because they don't do this very often. So what have you seen those leaders doing well to help them get some of the help they need and help make sure that they can make a small investment now to save a lot later on? I mean, the obvious one is, is putting the right people on the program in the first place. Some organizations will put people under performance management or junior people on programs to do you know, grunt work, when actually th- those people are best doing the grunt work. This is lack of business process owners and people that are driven, you know, have been given the permission to challenge the convention and the way things work today. They've got the knowledge of the way things work and they've got the, the enthusiasm and the intellect to be able to change things. I think putting the right change agents on a program is the obvious one. Yeah. And that it may cost a little bit more because you've got to backfill some of those people or you lose some of that data in your day-to-day operations. But it's probably the easiest thing to do. It's the, it's the lowest cost, simplest thing is to place your own chips in the right places to start with. Yeah. Um, I think recognizing that the systems integrator and the ERP vendor are commercial organizations that are beating to their own drum. They want to sell a solution this financial year. They want a big program and they want bums on seats. They want people doing that. I see a lot of people asking the the wolf for advice on how to lock the chicken pen. You know, how how should I do this? <laughs> um, yeah. And what they get is what they deserve, really. They get, they get stung, yeah? Yeah. The, the really simple things. Why would you start mapping as is processes once your SI is on site? Why would you not just do that before they start? It's not rocket science. Why would you pay a team of 30 people $1,500 a day to wait around while you shuffle paper? So just, just simple things like um, the as is part. Having we, we campaign a lot now on having an evergreen as is. So don't wait for a transformation to build your as is. Know what your processes are, know what your systems are, know what your interfaces are, have a report inventory, build that list, have that stuff ready. So when you start a program, it's evergreen and you can, you can impact assess and you can explain what you do today. That's simple yeah. stuff. You know, you can do that quite easily um, w- without having an SI on board. So I'd say that they're my f- probably first three go-tos. Very cool. I, I could probably talk I, I for think... a long time on these kind of things and... Th- the more you think about it and the more you think about that along the the way a program propagates, there's always, um, the, I call this mind sweeping, right? So you're always a couple of hundred meters ahead of the fleet looking for the next thing that's going to hit you. And there's lots of yeah. mind sweeping tactics on a program that you can, you can use. And people are so in the zone of what do I need to deliver today? I've got a deliverable to hit. They don't sit back and see the, see the full horizon. Yeah, I love that mind sweeping because when you look up and out a little further, you can see some of those things coming before they actually get there. Those risks, those turn into issues. And if you can tackle those before they really bite you, you can yeah. save a lot of money. Yeah. Stuart, yeah. if somebody's 
watching this and they are looking to make sure that they're part of the 30% that win. Um, what is the, you know, one or two things you really on your heart wish for them to take with them, no matter what they do, no matter where they go. I'm going to get my book out for this one. I'm going to actually do it based on stats and research rather than um, whimsical um, kind the, of the uh, off the cuff comments. In terms of success levers, the one that has the biggest impact on budget, and when we did this piece of research, and you can download this on the website, by the way, um, the one that has the biggest impact on budget is the failure to standardize your solution. And that goes back to that and competitive advantage and commodity processes thing I mentioned before. It goes back to having awareness of what the solution does. If you customize, it has the biggest detriment on your cost profile. If you look at the graph, I mean, I'll, I'll hold it up, but that big black bar is the biggest negative correlation with anything which is failure to standardize on budget. It's huge. But, but equally the other way, when I look at the other, another, another graph, this one's on hitting business case, the big green bar here, so where is that there? is the people who have an adoption mindset, they focus on adoption, are the people who um, make the biggest gain on hitting the business case. So I would say, standardize the solution, focus on adoption. If you do those two things, they're the kind of biggest two ingredients to winning on budget and winning on um, kind of outcome. Amazing, amazing. In the term customization, there's the big C customization and then there's the small C like, hey, this needs to be automated a little better so we don't need to hire four more people to go do it the pure vanilla way. Yeah. I kind of liken it to the uh, the off-the-rack suit. And if you put the off-the-rack suit on and nobody hems the cuffs and the pants, it's very difficult to run quickly. Yeah. And yeah. sometimes I see the no customization over applied. It is absolutely correct, but sometimes it's over anchored or over emphasized in some of the decision making. How would you encourage somebody to think about some of the the little automations that either help with data quality or help reduce some of the, the number of people that are sometimes needed. Those are usually, they're not necessarily a strategic differentiator, but for somebody that maybe is coming from a system that had some of that, either it was a unique system just for their industry or something like that. What advice would you have for folks to tell the difference between something that would really need to have extra people to run it pure vanilla or something that a small automation can make a big difference. So we've got quite a, a, a very, I guess, pragmatic and simple view of this. Um, and when I say it, it sounds too simple, but it really, really works. The which best is, things are simple. Which is if you allow business people to um, vent the things that they tolerate, Right. Toleration is a really interesting word. Toleration is the stuff that happens that isn't quite enough, quite important enough for you to moan about every day. You just put up with it. The yeah. squeaky door problem, you know, the, the squeaky stair problem. You never go and get the WD-40 because the door squeaks and you've just lived with a squeak. If you get people to vent and list everything they tolerate, day-to-day -day business processes, processing sales orders or purchase recs or goods receipts, list everything. And then if you address those tolerations for them, and you turn their frown upside down a little bit, uh, you get them leaning in and you get easier to drive adoption. So my yeah. advice would be to, to, be to say, fix the squeaky door problems, fix the things that matter to the people. Don't worry whether they're, you know, simple, complex, technically complex, they're a rice F, however you've categorized them. Just take a few tolerations away and the business people will lean in. And when you've got that, you've got momentum yeah. towards your kind of adoption. And, and when yeah. you've got that, then you're more likely to be able to engage them to find out what you need to do to get to the next level. And then can, kind of continuous transformation comes in a little bit rather than a big transformation program. Once you get yes. that rolling, it's the magic happens then. Yeah. These don't need to be big, complex things. You can you can do it piecemeal. And with things like you mentioned, small automation, some of the we are moved towards composable ERT, ERP. A move towards a world where you've got things like UiPath um, or ServiceNow and you've got APIs. You don't need really huge numbers of highly skilled people. You just need to understand your data model, understand what's possible, and sit down with business people and just increment slightly. I think the world will move with composable ERP more towards a continuous transformation mindset than it will big capital programs. Yep, bite-sized improvements in the right direction. Yeah. are easier to digest, easier to swallow, easier to take, and way more cost-effective, way easier a, to get right. 
there is a flip to that though is when you move to more industry cloud platforms or cloud-based erp you can't stop the enhancements coming down the funnel you're fed yeah. like foie gras you know you basically next week salesforce are launching these 20 new things and you're like Oh, that, we've got. To, we need to train the workforce. So I think there's that flip as well, which is it makes you have to change, or it gives you new features that you then feel like you've got to put through a funnel to work out how you use them, and you flip to that. What does the business need, um, and what should we do? So we have these new features. How can we use them? And that's quite a dangerous kind of slider. Yeah. So that yeah. needs it needs a slightly different design governance and architectural thinking, I think, to make that flip from behemoth custom builds ERPs to slick cloud-based ERP solutions that are released every month and every quarter. Evolving quickly. And, you know, I think Mm. about even just people that use Teams or Zoom, there's new features that just show up and and people roll with them. The ability, the appetite, and the pace of change people have become accustomed to is so much higher than it once was. The number of things that can be digested that don't need a whole training program um, are quite remarkable. It's pretty exciting. Stuart, yes. I'm so grateful for you making the time. I hope that everybody watching this can go and take several things away from the goal that you've shared to go and help them be part of that 30%. And thank you again. I hope everybody can tune in next week for another edition of The Never Ending Climb for Stronger Supply Chain and Procurement for companies running SAP. Thanks, everyone.